Hi, Ben with Novel X Stereophonic. Unfortunately, on the bench today, I have my Sencor PA81. This is one of my most essential pieces of bench test equipment, and it's on the fritz, so I need to get this thing repaired before I can continue on with any of my other projects. So what's going on here is I have an issue in the left channel, um, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. I am halfway through the diagnosis procedure. I've ordered some replacement parts, and I wanted to, to capture this on video in case I can resolve and fix this issue. It may help someone else that's having the same problem with their PA81. So let me fire it up. Right now, I'm on the audio lines input, and both meters are set to auto range. I'm feeding the sa same signal into the left and right channel, but only the right channel is responding. The left channel, I have no meter action and no audio output. So that's the initial symptom. Let's dig into this thing and uh, see what's going on. So in front of us, I have the left channel of the PA81's input section. So the way that this unit works is whether you're selected on the dummy load, the line input or the voltmeter, those test signals all get fed to the same circuit for measurement. So what I did is I just fed a sine wave into the line input and started tracing it through the circuit. And what I found is that at this IC, I lost my signal. So I'm gonna go through uh, how I did the signal tracing at the previous circuit, and then we're gonna look into this IC in detail because I think this is where my problem is. So where I'm gonna start here is IC38. The input signal is coming into pin five and coming out pin seven. So we should see the signal coming in here being amplified at pin 7 and present at pin 14 of the suspect chip. So I'm going to uh, move the camera around and we're going to take a look at those signals. Now I don't feel like setting up for a screen capture on this so I'm just going to show you where I'm probing and then spin the camera up and we'll look at the scope while I'm going between the different points. So I'm going to start out with pin 5 on IC38. So IC38 is here. Um, this is pin one, so I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five. And that's gonna be the first signal we look at. And then six, seven. So this is my input and this is the output. All right, we're up on the scope. This is going to be pin five. So we can see I've got an input signal there. And then pin seven, I have the amplified output. So next we're gonna look at IC50. So we're supposed to have a signal at pin 14. I have a test lead tied to this, so I'm gonna be tying onto here to test pin 14. And then pin one is right here. So this is pin 14. That's our signal from the previous stage. And then the output of the chip, pin one, I have no output. So I'm suspecting that this IC is bad. The next thing I always do when troubleshooting shooting ICs is I try to find the data sheet, figure out what the IC is doing, and see if I can uh, figure out if it's safe to bypass it and um, what the problem might be. So after looking up this IC, which is an MC14053B, I determined that in this circuit, Sencor is using it as a triple, double pull, double throw, logic controlled switch. So basically it's three small signal switches in one package that are controlled by um, high and low signals from a logic, uh, logic output. Let's take a closer look at the function of this IC in circuit. So at pin 14, that's where our signal enters. And then the, the purpose of this chip is to switch in one, both, or none of these operational amplifiers. So that's determined by logic that's coming in on these three lines here. And we'll take a closer look at the inside of this and it'll make some more sense. But basically, uh, in, the, in most of the ranges of this IC, or most of the ranges of the, the uh, test input, when the signal comes in pin 14, it's going to pass straight through to pin 1 and come out of the chip. If you're in one of the two lowest ranges, the absolute lowest range will get fed through both of these operational amplifiers uh, in a cascade. If uh, you're in the second to lowest range, it just goes through the first one. So this chip's whole pr uh, function is to determine if it's going to switch in the extra amplification. Now, the reason this is done is so that when you're measuring very low input signals, um, you can hear it and get an accurate reading on the meter. And this is one of the strengths of the PA81. Most oscilloscopes, if you're going down into a very low range, you're not going to be able to effectively see the tiny signals that you'd get out of like a phono stage or looking at very minute changes in DC voltage at a very low level. So that's, that's what the function of this chip is. Um, let me bring up the diagram that I drew to kind of decode what's going inside and this might make a little bit more sense. Okay, so what I've done here is kind of just drawn what exists inside of this IC if we're using it as a switch. So the input signal from the previous stage comes into pin 14. 
if it's in any of the top ranges, 0.1, 1, or 100x, it's going to get switched from here to pin 13 and go out to the rest of the circuit. If you're in the second to last range, it's going to skip this, go to pin 12, which gets fed into the first operational amplifier stage, comes back in, and at that point it would exit pin 1 and, and go out um, to the rest of the circuit. If we're in the absolute lowest range of the PA81, it, when it gets to this point, instead of leaving, it's going to get switched in here. It's going to come back through the second operational amplifier and, and go out on pin 3. So regardless of which um, amplifier is activated, pin 1, pin 3, and pin 13 are all tied together at the output. So whichever one of these is active, those pins all lead to the output, um, which is shown here. So at this point, I don't know what's wrong with this IC if it is having trouble with some of the internal switching or if it's logic control. So that's what I'm going into next. Just as a proof of concept, I want to make sure the rest of the circuit behind this chip is functional. So what I did is I soldered a lead to pin 14, which has that signal on it. And I'm gonna feed that back into pin one just to make sure that the rest of the circuit is working properly. So I'm going to move the camera to, the, to look at the front panel meter while I touch the test signal to pin one. Okay, I'm going to feed pin 14 back into pin 1 of the chip to pass the signal through. And we can see that it's going up here, but it's not auto-ranging properly, I don't think. There we go. And it's coming through. So I think it's working, but it's, it's having trouble auto-ranging. But at least I know that the amplification circuit works and looks like the measurement works as well. So now I just have to figure out what's what's failed with relation to this IC. Okay, let's take a look at some voltages. So let's start off with the positive rail voltage for the IC. It should be 5 volts. We're seeing 4.7 and it's not particularly stable. If I go over to the working channel's positive rail, let's see what we get there. Yeah, that looks much better. Um, what about the negative rail? That should be on pin 7. That looks fine. So it's possible that something's shorted inside of this IC and it's pulling down the positive rail. The other thing I want to look at is the logic. So let me get around here. The logic is on pins 9, 10, and 11. So if I go to pin 9, I have a voltage there. And then pin 10 is low, pin 11 is low. So right now I'm in the lowest range. If I switch up to the next range manually, 9 goes low, 10 high, 11 low. And then the next range, these are all the ones that's going to be passing the signal straight through. So we're low on both of these pins. And 11 should remain high until we circle back to the lowest range. So it looks like the logic signals coming to the chip are fine. So it's most likely that the chip itself has had some sort of internal failure. So the next step is I'm going to pull the chip, put a socket in it, and then we're going to try a replacement and see if there's any change in performance. All right, so the next step is going to be pulling this entire board um, because I need to get to the back uh, side to desolder this IC. So. Luckily, Sencor has color-coded a lot of the stuff. So we've got red, white, black, orange. So it's, it's gonna be kind of obvious where stuff goes back in, but I'm gonna go ahead and take a few uh, pictures of this so that I don't lose track of anything. And um, we'll pull this board and get to it. All right, I've got all the screws removed. Let's see if we can extract this thing. Okay, the board is now removed, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to pull this IC and then socket it.
This is a pretty important piece of test equipment for me, so I went with kind of a nice socket. We'll see it in a minute, but this is the part number. Okay, the board is reinstalled in the unit. Um, you can see the socket here. While I was in there, I also socketed the other IC from the other channel. I figure if this IC has failed once, it may fail again in the future. So I might as well put a socket on the other channel while I'm in there. Next up, I'm going to install a replacement chip. Uh, this is basically the same partner number from TI and it uh, had all, all the same pinout, same voltage. So this should be a good swap. Okay, moment of truth. All right, I'm in auto range on both channels. Let's put in a test signal. So far, so good. I'm just going to range this way down. Good. So I think that did the trick. Let's see what happened to that positive supply. Okay. Well, that's quite a bit better. Let's check the logic signals. Yeah, so, I mean, the proof is there, it works. So it must've been something shorted inside of that chip. Okay, now I'm gonna put it back up at the bench into position and just make sure that it's um, all working properly. When I uh, was doing my initial diagnosis before I ordered the parts, that little wire that I had in, I soldered in and actually jumped it from pin 14 to pin one. And what happened is I had just a ton of noise. So I think when I bypassed it, whatever was going on inside of that IC was causing other issues. So um, when we put it back up here, we'll see if the output is clean on both channels. Got the PA81 back up in its spot on the bench and hooked up to my scope down here. And it looks like everything's good. So my outputs are clean before this was all like hashed and, and, and ugly. So there must've been some sort of uh, issue with that chip that was affecting uh, both channels or maybe my jumper that I had put in caused uh, caused it to become a noise antenna. In either case, that IC replacement seems to have fixed the issue. Just as a demonstration of how sensitive this device is, I'm gonna put my signal generator down to the lowest level. It can do two millivolts peak to peak. <clears throat> and we can see it's in the, the lowest range. Let's see if I can get the trigger a little bit more stable here. And it's displaying the, you know, it can amplify that signal so I can hear it the noise behind it, but it's working really, really well. So this PA81 is back in business. Um, thanks for coming along with me on this one. I'm glad I could figure this out. And hopefully if someone's got the same issue, I can uh, give them a little shortcut to getting their PA81 back up and running. Thanks again for stopping by the channel. See you in the next one.